But it was a real privilege to have these little discussions. Um, we have Elder Peter Schuler, and he is from New Credit in southern Ontario. And it is an Ojibwe community, yes? Anishinaabe. And our other speakers here for our uh, session called The Dark Side of Social Innovation. Very interesting. It is described as, uh, this session is described in this way. Social innovation is a tricky, fickle thing. And while it's generally seen as a good thing, sometimes there are adverse effects. So here to discuss the dark side of social innovation are Tim Draymond. Tim? He is the Executive Director of Social Innovation Generation, which aims to support accelerated strengthening of Canada's social innovation ecosystem. SIG's programs address Canadians' ability to innovate to overcome large-scale complex social and environmental challenges through new forms of problem solving via cross-sectoral partnerships and social innovation labs. That was a complex sentence. Okay. And our next um, panelist is Daniel McCarthy. And he is a faculty member with the Waterloo Institute of Social Innovation and Resilience, as well as an associate professor and associate chair of the undergraduate studies in the Department of Environment and Resource Studies at the University of Waterloo. His interdisciplinary academic background has focused on exploring the utility of complex system-based approaches to understanding and intervening in linked social, ecological, epistemological systems. So, to discuss the adverse effects and the dark side of social innovation, please welcome our panelists, Daniel, Tim, and Peter, Elder Peter. And is somebody want to start? Uh, we, we're, we're all mic'd. Okay. okay thank oh, you. they're mic'd, very good. Yeah. Th thank you very much, Tina. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all in, on the territory of uh, Treaty 1 in the home of the Métis people. I'm Tim Draymond, and I'll just uh, give a brief introduction, and then um, Dan will speak, and then uh, Pete will speak. And uh, hopefully, uh, when we're all finished, we'll be able to have a chance to have a conversation with you or amongst you as well uh, on uh, some of the issues that emerge from, from this discussion. So maybe I'll just, I'll just start. <clears throat> So um, what we'd like to do is just uh, help, uh, uh, help us all bring uh, different lenses to what are social innovations. Uh, we have an assumption uh, that social innovations are really things that generate positive outcomes. Uh, but in actual fact, in many instances, social innovations inadvertently um, have negative outcomes or perhaps they're being introduced in a top-down manner without really uh, considering uh, the people with whom the innovation will impact and it might have a negative consequence. Or sometimes even social innovations could be uh, malevolently used by somebody um, or people uh, for, for a negative or bad uh, purpose or outcome. And so we think at the same time as we're all struggling to figure out uh, how can we be better at generating positive social innovations, uh, we have to recognize that every social innovation will have some outcomes that we won't be able to predict and that it's really incumbent upon us to try to think uh, carefully about what could be the impacts of these social innovations and to understand the need to in to involve the people uh, for whom the social innovation is expected to benefit uh, as a part of a process of, of creating the social innovation. And uh, uh, as this cartoon uh, points out, um, everything that we create, no matter how wonderful at first glance, there's always going to be a shadow side. And so with that, I'm just going to turn to Dan uh, to talk about his perspective on social innovation's dark side. Am I on? There we go. Um, hi, everybody. My name's uh, 
Dan McCarthy. I'm uh, from the University of Waterloo. Um, I grew up in a small town not far from the University of Waterloo, actually called Waterdown, which jurisdictionally doesn't exist anymore. So I'm a very white kid from southern Ontario. Um, I, uh, I have uh, some great teachers. Uh, some of them are in this room. Uh, one of them is sitting next to me. Um, and they've uh, taught me over the years to, uh, to do certain things. And so I, I'm, um, yeah, I, mean, I want to acknowledge the, the territory, Treaty 1, and the, the home of the, the Métis people. I um, also want to say um, my, uh, I have an Anishinaabe name, um, Nabujage Nini, uh, which essentially means something like one who can see through things or something like that. And essentially, I was told I got that after a, a fast that I did. Um, my role is to sort of help translate, see through things. Um, I think I'm a pretty terrible translator, but I'm working on that. And I've had the privilege of working with uh, First Nations people in um, mostly in Ontario for the last 10 years or so, and have learned an enormous amount, uh, but mostly an enormous amount about myself. Um, I also study complexity. And uh, it's that lens that has brought me to this idea of social innovation. Um, and uh, every theory, every idea is a lens. Uh, every concept, every heuristic, however, whatever academic terms you want to use, is a lens on the world. Um, and it's always imperfect, and it's always flawed, and it's always limited. Um, we have, uh, on a good day, um, neuroscientists believe we can perceive or understand or receive about 5% of what's going on around us. Um, and we, uh, we have learned to interact with and have evolved structures in order to be able to see the world in certain ways. Um, I did this because of hands, you know, opposable thumbs. Um, I wasn't just going like but we've also evolved eyes in order to be able to see certain things, and they evolved in certain ways. People remember Jurassic Park and the uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex not being able to see the people if they weren't moving. And uh, that's sort of right. Um, it's like a frog's eye. It needs to be able to. It's evolved and interacted with its environment over a very long time in order to be able to see the things it needs to eat and sees the, needs, the things it needs to avoid. And those are things that move, so it generally focuses on those. So it actually sees the world in different ways. And so one of the things that I've come to realize by, through understanding complexity and systems thinking is there are many ways of understanding the world at many scales. And some of the most different and profound and powerful learning experiences I've uh, encountered have been working with elders like Peter and some other fantastic teachers that I've had the privilege of, of working with that have taught me all kinds of things, bad jokes, um, but also how limited my worldview is and how limited the way that I see things uh, really is. Um, it's, uh, it's a truly humbling experience to be able to run into a person who can teach you true humility and an understanding that you only see a tiny bit of the world. And so every time we look at a phenomena like innovation or a concept like progress, we put a boundary around it and we look through it like this. If they're students of mine, they'd all laugh because whenever I talk about this concept from systems thinking called bounded rationality, I do this. Because things that make perfect sense within a particular boundary, when you step back and look at them from a different perspective, can often make no sense whatsoever. And you can imagine how a concept like innovation can have those kinds of unintended consequences. I remember working in, um, I had the privilege of working in a First Nation on the west coast of James Bay, mostly Fort Albany First Nation. Um, another amazing learning experience. And I, I, it was at that time that I was hired by Francis, um, she's at the back, um, uh, to, uh, to look at this concept of social innovation. I'm still grateful, by the way. Thank you. I hope you are. Um, and uh, to try and understand it through a complexity lens. And I remember having sort of quite distinct 
worlds where I would fly up to Fort Albany and uh, work with chief and council and pretty much do whatever Andrew, the, the chief, told me to do. We learned very quickly not to impose. Um, and, uh, and that's, uh, again, an incredibly dangerous thing to do. Um, and uh, I remember saying to Francis on occasions when we were talking about social innovation, I said, I, Francis, I don't know how this incredibly white concept is going to be of any use to my First Nation colleagues. I just, I mean, I'm, I'm not seeing it. Obviously a terrible, terrible translator. And it wasn't until I was sitting in a uh, sort of a building not unlike this and watching my daughters uh, dance on a stage at a dance competition, which is always weird. And actually they weren't dancing. And I received a phone call from another traditional practitioner that I work with, um, Martin Millen. And, uh, uh, we'd been working on environmental policy kinds of things together, and he said, Dan, I just came across this website on social innovation, and your name was on it. Why didn't you tell us about this? This is what we're doing. This is what we need. And I was like, wow. I hadn't made that connection until he was able to make it for me. And seeing that concept through his eyes opened up a whole bunch of possibilities, and that's why this this event is so exciting. And actually, it was along those lines that I started working with a couple of uh, Anishinaabe uh, grad students who've been amazing teachers. And uh, we thought we would look into this idea of constructing a course on, on indigenous innovation. And we actually ran a reading course to figure out what we would need to put in it. And we realized at the end of it that in the context which we were working, we weren't ready. We weren't there yet. We needed to take a step back. We were doing this. And that was when we realized that at my institution, we needed something much more basic, a much more basic understanding of indigenous issues, indigenous values, indigenous ideas, indigenous teachings. And so I went to Peter and I uh, offered him tobacco to work with me and uh, develop a, a course that we would run together um, looking at understanding, uh, introducing ideas of uh, just indigenous ways of knowing to environmental studies students. And um, I've been working with Peter ever since on that. It's been a, a real struggle. And again, I've learned an enormous, about my, an enormous amount about myself and an enormous amount about my institution through this process and the limitations and the bounded rationality and we're supposed to be one of the most innovative institutions in Canada. So I guess the, the dark side is this notion of bounded rationality and the idea that we often come to problems with a view of the world and we don't even realize the limitations of the view that we're bringing and the implications that it can have and how many times over the past that we have done this over and over again. And so I raise that as a caution but also a hope that there are incredibly patient teachers out there, some of them are now walking in at the back, that will help us to understand different ways of knowing and see in ourselves the limitations we bring to problems. Thank you. Take it away, Uncle Peter. Thank you. I don't think it's on. Bonjour. Je suis gagné les indigènes cas, mais je suis qu'un Au début, je n'avais rien d'au. Nous crédit en don juba. En don juba, on bangi yet go. What I said in uh, that little bit of language that I have, I told you my name, my clan, and where I'm from, and that I speak my language or understand my language very little. And um, <clears throat> before I start talking about what I want <clears throat> to talk about. I have to apologize to the, uh, the people who invited me here. They asked me to provide a picture and a bio. And um, I'm not really technically savvy. 
Um, and so I, I didn't get that to them. But the real reason, this is my excuse anyway, that I didn't do that, is because somebody told me one time that if you find a turtle sitting on a fence post, you know damn well it didn't climb up there by itself. I belong to the turtle clan. And uh, <clears throat> inside me, there's a little boy someplace. And this little boy, he wants to take you for a walk. Outside, it's snowing out. Things are froze up. But this little boy, he wants to take you for a walk to this pond. And in that pond, in order to get there, you have to walk through this little bush. And in the middle of that bush, there's a great big maple tree. And this tree is so big, if you're standing on the road and look at this bush, you think there's a hill in the middle of the bush. But it's just that tree, that one tree that's so old, it stands above all the trees around it. And you pass that tree, and you come to this little pond. And if you stand around that pond and look in the water, that water is clear. And you can see things in this water. And sometimes when you go there, those frogs become alarmed that they jump into the water. If you're not really quiet, they all jump in the water. They hide under the leaves. Some of them pop back up again, and they're looking up at you. And sometimes in that pond, there's a turtle. And if you look in the bottom of that pond, you'll see little bugs, and they're all covered with sticks. And they're inside there. They made themselves a little house. And you see pollywogs in there. And you see egg masses where the toads laid their eggs. And you see these little red newts in there. It's little salamanders. And if you stand around that pond, you see dragonflies flying around. And so that's where I want to take you to that pond. I want you to look in the water. I want you to hear the birds. And so you're going to say, what the heck's that got to do with the dark side of social innovation? You know what? I don't have a clue. <laughs> but in that pond is my, uh, my clan, the turtle. And that turtle, he just sits on the bottom. And he sits there. And if there was a little fish in there, if that fish swam past that turtle, that turtle would go snap, just like that, and take that fish. Let's go back to that guy sitting on top of the fence post. How did he get there? That turtle that's sitting up there. He didn't climb there by himself. Somebody put him up there. But that's not where he's supposed to be. He's supposed to be on the bottom of that pond. And once in a while he goes out of that pond and he lays eggs someplace and he goes back in the water again. And that frog, he sits there and if a fly flies past, he grabs it. And those eggs, they hatch out. And now you got those little tadpoles running all over the place. And if that bullfrog is in there, you can see that tadpole get bigger and bigger. And sooner or later, he's got legs. And you can watch him turn into a frog. I grew up at a time when there was one-room schools. I grew up at a time when I saw the last of the thrashing machines and the farmers using them with the horses. And I'm not like these guys here. I don't have uh, an education. When I paint, I use a really wide brush, these guys they get down into all the nitty gritty. And maybe what I might call social innovation, they might call something different. 
But as I look at things, just about any innovation becomes social innovation. When I look at those farmers, and you have Henry Ford, and Henry Ford makes a car. And from that car become tractors. And so that tractor changes the way farmers farm. Instead of now having to get together with all their neighbors to do their thrashing, they come with a combine, they do it all by themselves. They become independent. And it's much more efficient. But it breaks down society. The neighbors don't talk together so much anymore. And the people change the way they live. This is not new. This has happened before. And when we think we innovate, I think a lot of times we only repeat things that we did before that we didn't learn from. In my pocket here, I have one of these thingamajig is here, but it's not working. Dark side. <laughs> In my other pocket someplace, if I didn't lose it, I have a cell phone. Great social innovation. Connects everybody, everybody's doing great. We all talk, and uh, that's a great thing. This morning I sent my wife a text. I should have phoned her. I should have brought her here, as a matter of fact. My wife is, is uh, my, my teacher. She keeps me in line. She made this shirt. She made this drum bag. So I brought part of her, but I should have brought her personally. So this text, this cell phone, the dark side, we don't interact. We sit at the table and we are texting and eating. We're sitting uh, here. And you're out there listening and you're texting somebody. And when do you quit work? You're now able to work 24 hours a day. You have a phone, you can phone, you can do this. That, that, that little phone I have is, is, is a computer. And what do computers do? You know, I have a brain. When I was a kid, we had this thing called Etch-a-Sketch. You had these two little knobs, you drew pictures, and if you shook it, the screen is blank again. My brain is like that. I learn things, I shake my head, and I forgot it already. <laughs> Why is it like that? And what's happening to your brain? When you use computers and you got Google, you got this, you don't have to remember anything more because you can just Google it. And slowly, I think our memories are, are going to fade out. Mine faded out because too much uh, monkeying around when I was a kid, maybe. But I see this as a, as a problem that could happen. And you know, I remember when that farmer next door, when I was just a kid, he still had two workhorses. And I remember going over there, and he set me on top of that horse. And that horse, his skin was so loose, I thought it was going to fall off. It was just, you know, and um, I didn't know what I was seeing when I was just that small. I didn't understand there was a dark side to this progress. And so one thing we can uh, talk about is the really, really dark side. And I think that's been mentioned here at this conference and last night was the, the residential schools. This is a really, really dark side of social innovation. And go. I speak my language very little. That's because somebody decided that 
all people should be the same, that they should all speak the same language, that they should all think the same way, that they should all become, as I tell the students and make Dan nervous, don't become a ceiling tile. That's what this institution is going to try to do to you. They're going to try to turn you into a ceiling tile or a floor tile. They're all the same. Look at them. They're all exactly the same. All the ceiling tiles are the same. Don't do that. This thing that was talked about last night, this uh, residential school, It perpetuated a lot of things. When I introduced myself in the language, I told you my name. But I didn't tell you what my name meant. My name means uh, a man who writes. But I'm not really a writer. I just write things down when they come. Don't consider myself to be that, but those things come. I want to read you something. If I can read my own writing, that's, a, that's the other downfall of uh, things that we used to be able to remember this. We wouldn't have to read it. Do you want to be an Indian? Nobody asked me if I wanted to be an Indian. I just was. That's what my dad told me. I just was. My grandmother, she just was too. So who is it that doesn't recognize me? The Creator recognizes me. You recognize me, didn't you? So who is it that doesn't recognize me? The government, you say. What does he look like? The one who doesn't recognize me. He has many faces, you say. Must be kind of strange to have more than one face. Probably confuses a lot of people. Maybe one of his other faces will recognize me. Now you want to change the question so I will understand. Do I want to be recognized as an Indian? I need a status card, you say, to be recognized as an Indian. Where do I get it? From the government, you say. The one with all the faces, he will give it to me. Then he will recognize me. No, he will recognize the card. That is the dark side are part of the dark side of the residential school. We became numbers. We didn't have names. If you had a name, they took it away and gave you another one. And then in some places, it was just a number. And I look at this and I didn't go there. I grew up within 20 miles of a residential school, and I did not know what it was. And I didn't know what it was until I was 30 or 40 years old. I heard about it, but nobody called it by that name. They called it the mush hole. And they said, you better behave yourself or we're going to send you to the mush hole. But nobody said what it was. And so this innovative idea to make everyone the same, to make everyone fit in, had a truly, truly dark side. And I think with what um, has been spoken of here and last night, um, we can change that. Last night gave me lots of hope. Fred Kelly when he spoke, you were listening to how our ancestors thought, how they spoke, how well they could speak, their humor. You were listening to that. And when I come here and I look at who's here, and I think to myself, boy, I wish my wife could hear this, or I wish the students from home could hear this. And, um, you know, maybe that guy who's 
hanging around the corner, still drunk. I wish he could hear this, or she could hear this. Because this is what we need to hear. We need to recognize the dark side. We need to acknowledge it. But we need to get past it. And there are all kinds of things I think about when it comes to the dark side of innovation. A few years back, I heard, oh, they're going to make fuel out of plant matter. They're going to make ethanol. And I thought, geez, that's a really good idea. Save the planet. But as I saw this evolve, I come to realize I'm driving a car with ethanol in it, and someplace else, somebody's starving to death. We didn't think it through. We didn't look and see what was going to come. And I think this is a caution that we have to look at when we think about things. Right now in uh, the Middle East, somebody's using that cell phone to plan how they're going to blow somebody up. Somebody's using technology to harm someone else. We have the porn industry using technology to hurt women, children. That's a dark side. And I think, I'll, I'll tell you before I go into the uh, sweat lodge at home, I take some tobacco. And I acknowledge that dark side, that dark spirit. And I say, you're not invited here. I'm not going to talk to you. And I do this, and I explain to people, I do this because, and that's hard to explain. I said, you know, if we went to the, the 401 highway, and we decided we're all going to run across there at rush hour, we'd all get run over. But if we recognize there's danger, and we went to the proper authorities, and we said, hey, we want to cross here, we could stop the traffic, we could go across, and we'd all be safe because we recognize the dark side. And I think this is something that we need to do with technology, is to recognize there is a dark side and to look at it. Think about what we're going to do and to try to analyze and mitigate as much as we can when we bring things in. And myself, I'm not really good at planning things. And uh, I tend to... Uh, not think about things as much as I should, perhaps. But I think we're all like that when it comes to things like this. So I think I better quit talking, though, because I talk too much, my wife says. And I, and I kind of tend to agree with her. And Dan usually goes like, gives me the throat cut. Miigwech. Miigwech. Miigwech to our speakers. And um, I just want to see we have about seven minutes, and so if we have any questions. Don't be shy, I will come to you. Just put your hand up. No? Okay. So I'm gonna ask a question then. Okay, so here we go. Um, I was thinking about um, the, these are my notes. These are my little housekeeping notes. These are my other notes. I've been involved with a number of um, projects um, that recently that have um, been really about reconciliation, whether it's, you know, and how we do business in the industry sector, whether it's how we do, um, how we do arts projects. And I, you had mentioned um, that, and your name is Tim. Right, and Tim, you, I heard you mention that there is sometimes this um, recognition that you, we don't often realize that we are um, we are presupposing things, and that we have a sort of a conditioning, and that's that's true. I think also for Indigenous people, a lot of us, you know, in particular my age, maybe not the younger generations, but certainly my age group where we were, um, you know, really sort of battling 
um, stereotypes, history lessons, uh, you know, lack of uh, participation in Canadian society. And so, you know, we were often, um, a lot of the a lot of the messaging that I received was to you know be quiet don't you know don't say anything don't rock the boat and so you sort of you know find a little tiny space for yourself and as we as I've moved into these um, you know uh, different sectors and start these discussions about how we change one of the um, one of the interesting um, experiences for myself personally has been uh, this, and Judge Murray Sinclair talked about it this morning, was this idea that I shouldn't rock the boat or that I shouldn't be saying anything and that I just don't want to upset people. And I think that that's very true for um, a lot of people as they're sort of trying to move into um, new strategies or reconciliatory strategies, recognizing Indigenous knowledge and you know, sort of trying to um, find ways of putting new paradigms, you know, like out for thought even. So can you talk about some of the experiences of that, like how you would work in the academic institutions or across sectors or, you know, trying to explore that with other groups, I guess, and with Indigenous groups even? Oh, you have a mic. You have a mic. Is it on? Um, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I guess the, the, the first thing I would say is um, it's not, in my limited experience, it's not easy. And it can be painful and jarring for both parties because as you begin to work together and start to understand how far apart you are in a lot of ways, in both experience and understanding and everything, and then have that sort of mirror put up to yourself, it's, um, I mean, they talk about settler guilt. And um, for me, I mean, I, the other thing I usually do is acknowledge my privilege. My um, ancestors came here from Ireland in the 1840s as a result of the uh, Irish potato famine and came to Turtle Island and took advantage of the broken promises associated with treaties and they benefited from them and I continue to benefit from them. And I mean sometimes that kind of humility and acknowledging that kind of privilege is important and it's actually mostly a reminder for myself that I come from an incredibly privileged position. And that's, I mean, <laughs> humbling in the sense that how the hell did I end up, I mean up here, we were talking about this earlier. Um, but then interacting um, with indigenous colleagues, um, it's, it's a, a humbling and difficult experience. And I think one of the biggest issues, problems, is just a lack of understanding. I mean, I have only begun to understand the differences in, in between my perspective and some of the elders that I work with. I mean, it's just like, scratching the surface, but the learning has been, for myself and for my understanding myself, has been profound. And so I try to, with my students, and I mean, I try, <laughs> try to drag Pete into the classroom and others into the classroom, um, because only they can, you know, provide that kind of experience. I, I teach um, uh, out on the, out on Haida Gwaii, at the Haida, with the Haida Gwaii Higher Education Society. And, um, group of students from all across the country come together there and, and are immersed in, uh, in that incredible place. And uh, a Haida grandmother, uh, Barb Wilson, came in and was speaking to the students and, and afterwards they said, you know, could you, they came to me and they said, you know, we, she talked a little bit about residential schools and intergenerational trauma. They said, could you, you know, could we talk about that a little more? And I said, well, I can't talk about that, but I can ask. Barb if she would be willing to come back in. And so I offered her tobacco and, and she said, I said, well, this is you know, what I do with the elders when I'm back home. And she, said, she said, I don't know about tobacco, but she said, I'm trying to get into grad school and you can write me a letter of reference if you like. A little re reciprocity, I'm with you. Um, but I, I think that the main thing is people don't understand the gulf in the ways of knowing. I mean, we all assume it's like being a fish in water and the water is modernity and we forget 
that we're all swimming in it, and we think that everybody thinks the same. When there are people that can teach us how limited that perspective is, how beneficial it can be, but limited that perspective is, like elders. And we talk about innovation as bricolage. Francis can explain that better than I where you bring together lots of different ideas. And so new ideas, but also old wisdom. And I think we need to do a heck of a lot more of that. And when we do that, it's incredibly difficult when they come together. Because what ends up happening is, people like me, over time, start to slowly understand. But other people in institutions like mine, they, you say, you know, do you want to indigenize this institution? And they're like, well, of course. And then you start to say what that might look like and push that envelope a bit. And they go, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, we never agreed to that. Right. And that's that misunderstanding. And that's where, you know, being able to, the privilege of sitting with elders um, like I've had has been incredibly transformative. Not everyone gets that privilege. And um, I think that's the biggest thing is to try and help people understand the gulf. Thank you. I'd, um, I'm so sorry that we've run out of time. I see we do have one question. So if we could keep it really quick, um, we'll take your question. Yeah? I'm going to bring the mic to you. Okay. You guys had all that time. I could have just... Uh, Tanshi, um, I have a question for you about uh, the dark side of innovation because we say often that hindsight is 2020. So for me, I'm a youth, and we have a lot of youthful energy. We're really excited. We want to innovate. But what tools can we use and what resources should we access in order to make sure that we are being conscientious of the decisions that we're making? Thank you. Anybody? Maybe we can each like give a <coughs> quick, can we sure. give a quick response to that? Yeah. Um, so that's great. So I think that there's a growing um, set of resources that are available to people, and a lot of them are available digitally through the web. So the organization I'm involved with has a website called signknowledgehub.com, and uh, that has a, a lot of information on different topics, and you can go through that and, and discover um, information about it. Um, as, as well as that, there's a, within that, there's a, a lot of information about the development of social innovation labs, the development of new tools and processes to help people figure out how to do what Dan referred to, this bricolage, uh, through a lab process. And Dan's colleague, Francis Wesley, has a new guide to how to approach that. And you'll find information about that on, on our website, too, uh, 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 sigeneration.ca. And I'll, I'll stop there. I've probably talked enough, but I guess the things that I'll say are humility um, in these kinds of processes and uh, recognizing paradox. Um, it, it's really easy to oversimplify situations and demonize people, and um, um, but actually that can be incredibly counterproductive. And we are all implicated in the system that has created what we're dealing with in one way or another. And I think some measure of that kind of understanding is incredibly helpful. And like I say, that humility. Well, I'm not brief, but anyway. <laughs> I, I, I recently went back to the pond. The big old trees cut down. There's no more newts. Turtle's gone. And, and this is a result of advanced methods of farming, too much fertilizer, pesticides, and all those things. And I think when we're, we're looking ahead to try and do something new, you also have to go back once in a while, look, see what's happening. What, 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 what you're trying to bring in, you have to keep an eye on what it's doing. You have to look back. In, in, my, in my family, I'm the only one who tries to live in a traditional way and try to follow those beliefs. And my older sister says, you can't live in the past. And I agree. But you can bring the past ahead 
Because what we did in the past, we survived here for thousands of years and we didn't destroy our environment. We didn't kill the planet. So I think if you're trying to bring something new, you need to look back. One of the things I asked the students in what I, what I said, what, go around and find the old people. Ask them what isn't here anymore. What kind of birds don't you see? What kind of things don't you see anymore? And by looking back, you can see where you're going. You can see what you're doing. And if you're bringing something in that you can see is changing things to the negative, then you know that you're going the wrong direction. And that, that's the only advice I can give. It's free. It's worth as much as what it cost you. Yeah. Miigwech. Miigwech. Thank you so much.